Hello everybody, welcome back to my channel, welcome back to True Crime Tuesday. I know that I did post a video on Saturday that's just been, but I actually had a week off sort of before that, so the Tuesday and the Saturday before that, just because I'm back at work now, I'm actually like going into the office and it's a bit of a killer. Like I wasn't expecting it to be so busy and tiring and just crazy. So I did end up having the week off, but I'm back and I'm gonna really try not to make that happen again. I'm just gonna try and stay on top of it, even though I'm going into the office because this is fun and I really enjoy doing this. So I'm not gonna make a habit of disappearing for a week at a time. So I'm back today with another video and this case is very interesting. It's not got like a massive amount of information online, I don't think really. And I think that's probably because of the circumstances behind it and who was involved in it. So I think a lot of it is kind of kept secret, but we know the main bulk of the case and it's very interesting and it's a solved one. So we know what happened. So we don't have to be racking our brains to think about what could have happened. So I'm just gonna get right into this one and not talk any longer. This is the case of the Richardson family murders. On the 23rd of April, 2006, Police entered the home of the Richardson family and they found the bodies of Mark, 42, Deborah, 48, and Tyler, 8. And the only person that was missing from the house was 12-year-old Jasmine. So let's go back a little bit. The family, the Richardson family, the parents, Mark and Deborah, was married and they had two children. They had Jasmine and they had Tyler. As far as I could tell, they were a pretty normal family. They got on really well. There wasn't a massive amount online to describe their family life or anything that they used to do together or anything like that. It was pretty vague. But from what I could tell, they got on well together and the family just, they were just kind of like a normal family. And Jasmine in particular was described as a happy girl, sociable, friendly, just like a typical nice child. That was until she started to get towards her teenage years. In 2005, Jasmine started hanging out with a different friend group at school. She was starting to show interest in being a goth, she was wearing really heavy and dark makeup and making herself look a lot older and dressing exactly how she wanted to. She was expressing herself with her appearance. She was going through like the typical teenage stuff, you know, where you're trying to figure out who you are and what you want to be and how you want to portray yourself. She was going through that. But Jasmine started to get a little bit of a mean girl vibe to her. People would kind of avoid contact with her whenever they see her around the school. They'd like avert their eyes not to look at her just because she would be a little bit mean. So she didn't get on with everybody at the school, but she did have a new friend group that she really did click with. She used to get in trouble quite a lot at school. Her teachers would always tell her off for wearing makeup and the clothes that she would wear. And inevitably this just made her rebel even more. When your teachers tell you, not to do something it just makes you want to do it even more it's just that it just how teenagers work you can't a teacher can't tell them what to wear or what to do because it just makes you think mm, no I'm gonna do it my own way so she would just rebel and get in trouble all the time while she was at school in 2006 Jasmine attended a punk show or concert or something along those lines and that is where she met 23 year old Jeremy Steink or Steinker I think it's probably Steink, I'm gonna say that. Jeremy reportedly had a tough upbringing. His mother was an alcoholic and his stepdad used to abuse him. He was bullied at school and by the time he met Jasmine, he'd already attempted to take his own life once before. I'm not 100% sure whether Jasmine had lied about her age to go to this show, but you have to bear in mind the fact that she was 12 years old at this time and she met Jeremy, who was 23. So he was 11 years older than her. And even her friend group were not keen on this relationship developing because she was 12. Like you're still a child when you're 12. And even her friends knew that this was not a good thing to be doing. And inevitably her parents, Mark and Deborah, were really not happy about this. They would forbid Jasmine from speaking to Jeremy. She wasn't allowed to interact with him. They just had no interest in that. I think it's normal for a parent to not want their 12 year old daughter to be involved with somebody who's 23. That's completely what I would expect a parent to do. But Jasmine was 
besotted with Jeremy and he really liked her whether or not he knew that she was 12 I'm not 100% sure but Jasmine really liked him and the fact that her parents were telling her that she couldn't speak to him she couldn't see him only made it worse and she would just want to do it even more and she would just speak to him in secret and in private so that her parents didn't realise. Jeremy actually had a history of violence. His friends have said that he actually once told them that he was a 300 year old werewolf who liked the taste of blood and he also used to wear like a vial of blood around his neck on a necklace. So that just gives you a little insight into what Jeremy liked to do in his spare time. He was a werewolf so I imagine that Mark and Deborah would have really liked to know that about their 12 year old daughter's older boyfriend so that's cool. He had an account on a website called vampirefreaks.com and so did Jasmine and they used to use that website quite a lot to message each other backwards and forwards and they also used to use a website called Nextopia which apparently is popular among Canadians. I'm not sure whether it's still a thing or not, but that is another way that they used to message each other. Jasmine's username was Runaway Devil, and she actually had her age set to 15 on there. So that just makes me think that maybe when she was going to like concerts and things that she was probably pretending she was maybe 15 or 16. If she was acting as though she was 15 online, then it seems as though it was quite likely, even though we know that she wasn't that old. Obviously, the two of them continued speaking through these different online websites. They carried on getting closer. They would talk regularly and they were both really annoyed about the fact that Jasmine's parents were just so uncool and that they wouldn't let them be together and see each other and be a couple and they were just really mad at that. They used to discuss it regularly and express how annoyed they were at this fact. On the 3rd of April 2006, Jeremy actually wrote a post on his blog about the situation and he said, Payment. My lover's rents are totally unfair. They say that they really care. They don't know what's going on. They just assume. Their throats I want to slit. Finally, there shall be silence. Their blood shall be payment. But Jeremy wasn't the only one that would say things along these lines online. Jasmine would often say things like this. She even said to Jeremy once in an email, it begins with me killing them and ends with me living with you. Jeremy actually replied to Jasmine's email saying, well, I love your plan, but we need to get a little more creative with like details and stuff. Apparently, Jeremy had even mentioned this to his friends, but they obviously just thought he was joking because you're not naturally going to assume that somebody is serious about killing somebody, I don't think, although he was a werewolf so I think he just used to say things sometimes maybe for shock value so his friends just thought oh he's only joking Jeremy just says things sometimes so they didn't think to tell anybody about it they didn't ask him any further questions. On the 22nd of April 2006 the couple watched Natural Born Killers together this is a really, really well-known movie. I'm sure you've heard of it. It's really famous. It's about a couple who go on like a killing spree together. Perhaps they were just getting some ideas or inspiration for what they were planning on doing. The next day on the 23rd of April, the two went through with their plan of killing Jasmine's family. They left the house and the bodies were discovered the next day. One of Jasmine's little brother, Tyler's friends, went round to his house to see if he was playing out. He got to the house, there was obviously no answer. He had a look through a couple of the windows and he saw in the basement window that it looked as though there was somebody laid on the floor. So he was a little bit worried about this. He ran home back to his mum and told her what he'd seen and she immediately rang the police. Inspector Brent Secondiac went round to the house and he had a look through the windows just as Tyler's friend had done and he also spotted what he knew was a body in the basement laid on the floor. So he called for backup before he did anything else and he waited for them to arrive. At this point, he has no idea whether there's people alive in the house, whether there's a killer in the house, whether somebody is alive still to the point where they could be saved. 
he hasn't got a clue what he's about to be walking into. So when his team get there, they all go into the house to investigate what's going on. They go down into the basement and that is where they come across the bodies of Mark and Deborah. It became apparent that Deborah had been killed first. She'd actually been stabbed around a dozen times and it seemed as though Mark had actually tried to fight off his attacker with a screwdriver, but ultimately he had been overpowered and then he had been stabbed to death himself as well. The police went on to investigate the rest of the house to see if they could find any other family members and it was when they got upstairs to Tyler's bedroom that they found his body in his bed and he had had his throat cut. But now the police are really worried because... 12 year old Jasmine is the only person that's not in the house so now they think maybe she's being kidnapped, maybe she has been held hostage somewhere. They need to find Jasmine to know that she's safe because the rest of her family has been massacred. They put out an amber alert and a statement was put out too to say that they were searching for the Richardson's daughter regarding a serious family matter. Investigators obviously searched the entire house. They were looking for evidence to figure out what was going on. Maybe there would be like a ransom note or anything that could lead them to figuring out why Jasmine had been taken and where she could be or where she could be held. And they looked through all of Jasmine's things. They went through her bedroom, they searched everywhere. They even looked in her locker at school to see if there was anything there. And the things that they started to discover actually turned Jasmine from a missing person into the prime suspect of this case. One of the things that they found that they were really concerned with were emails back and forth between Jeremy and Jasmine. And the police actually managed to track the two of them down in Jeremy's truck and they were both instantly arrested. I'm not sure how true this is, but I did read that apparently witnesses at this scene said that the two of them admitted to the murders and that Jeremy said the family were gutted like fish. But I'm not sure if that's fully accurate or not. That's just what I read in a couple of different places, not everywhere. So I'm not sure how true that is, but that's interesting to know is if he was getting arrested and he was describing them as being gutted like fish. That is horrific. In 2007, Jasmine had her trial and she said that the emails with Jeremy were all just hypothetical. They weren't really something that they were ever gonna do. They were just chatting. It was nothing serious, nothing that they should be worried about. It's just hypothetical conversations. Despite her best efforts of trying to say that they never intended on going through with any of these hypothetical discussions. The jury found her guilty of three counts of first degree murder and she was given the maximum sentence for her age, which at this time she was 13. This meant that she got six years in jail followed by four years supervision in the community. Jeremy was convicted of three counts of first degree murder too, but he was sentenced to life because he was an adult when he committed these crimes. When he was asked why he murdered Jasmine's family, his answer was, when you find your soulmate, you do anything for them. I did anything. It's reported that the two of them exchanged letters in jail and that they actually agreed that they were going to get married one day. And apparently all of these letters were just very cold. None of them showed any remorse for what they did. They just planned on being together and getting married. So that kind of shows how much they cared about what they did. Jasmine had to go through quite a lot of rehabilitation and treatment and things after she was convicted of these crimes. Obviously because she was so young, I think they tried to rehabilitate you back into society because she, when she was released, she was only gonna be like 23. That's Jeremy's age when he committed the crime. Like they have to try and get you to be like a stable member of the community, otherwise you're just gonna end up back in the system. So she went through a lot, they did evaluations on her, just trying to make sure that she would be able to live a normal life after her sentence, which is quite controversial. I know a lot of people won't think that it's necessarily a good thing to just be in the system for such a short amount of time, six years in jail and then four years supervision isn't a lot to say that at the age of 12 she decided to murder both of her parents and her little brother 
Like that's, that's a serious thing. So I just, I find things like this very controversial when they're a child. It really reminds me of the James Bulger case, which is just honestly one of the worst cases I've ever, 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 ever heard about. It's just really difficult to know what is the best thing to do. The two killers in that case have gone on to have new identities and new lives. People don't know who they are, but I'm pretty sure that, I don't know if both of them or just one of them has been in trouble with the law multiple times since then. So it's just, I just think if you're such a young age and you're capable of doing such a horrendous crime, are you ever going to be able to be a normal person back in society? I just don't know if that's possible. Jasmine had some psychiatric assessments during all of this time and she was diagnosed with conduct disorder and oppositional defiant disorder as well. In 2016, Jasmine was fully released and she was given a new identity. It's not known whether or not she still speaks to Jeremy, who knows? He's gonna be in there for a long time. He should be in there for life, but I'm not sure whether he'll ever get out sooner than that. But it's not known whether their plans are still to get married one day or whether or not they speak at all. Who knows? That is all of the information that I've got on this case. If I missed anything out or there's anything that you think is important to add in, please let me know in the comments. I would love to know. I like to discuss these things with you guys. I'm also really curious to know about what you think. Do you think it was Jasmine's idea to do this and she talked Jeremy into it? Or do you think it's the other way around? Was Jeremy the ringleader in this and Jasmine just went along with it. To be honest, I think Jasmine had quite a lot to do with it. I don't think you could ever be convinced by a boyfriend or a girlfriend to kill your family if you were not slightly like inclined to do something like that. Like it's, oh, I don't know, it's really, it's just not, it's just not good. It's really, really horrific. I really hope that she has changed and she's just like a valuable member of the community now, wherever it is that she lives, whoever she is now. I think she might be like 27 now, so she's similar to my age. I hope that she doesn't ever get involved in anything like this ever again. She's got, presumably she's got no family now. I don't know about grandparents or any other family members. I couldn't really find any interviews done by anybody or her friends or anything like that. It was only those few friends of Jeremy's that really said anything. So I'm really interested to know what you think about this. How much can a person change when they commit a crime when they're a child? What do you think about that? I'm very interested to know. And if you've got any case suggestions, please feel free to let me know in the comments. I really like to do that. I've got a few case suggestions now that I'm looking forward to getting stuck into. So keep an eye out for upcoming videos on a Tuesday and Saturdays I'm still doing like scary story Saturdays about like haunted things because I love that kind of thing too. So if you like this kind of content definitely subscribe, turn on the bell for notifications, hit the thumbs up button and I will see you in my next one. Bye!